start. Hi, Dr. Wayne Dish again from Sparks Pediatric and Adolescent Medicine. Thanks for watching our video series for students. Today, instead of looking at my face, I'll let you look at one of my students. Hey, everybody. Chris. <laughs> Who has been kind enough to um, talk to us today a little bit about bilirubin. And bilirubin specifically in the newborn, because I really don't care about bilirubin in old people. I don't like old people. <laughs> Please remember that uh, these videos are designed for education. They're not designed to replace consultation with a physician. If you think your child needs to be seen, please give us a call. We'll be happy to see you here in our office at area code 775-359-7111. And once again, unfortunately, we really can't help you over the internet or the telephone. That would be bad medical care, and it just is not in your child's best interest that we try to do something like that. However, we'll see you here. So, bilirubin in the newborn comes in two major flavors. It comes in the flavor of direct and indirect, or conjugated and unconjugated. And when we're referring to conjugation for the sake of education, we're referring to the covalent bonding of two glucuronide moieties onto the bilirubin. And that makes it water soluble and thus easy to excrete. Each of these forms bilirubin, conjugated and unconjugated, has a different differential diagnosis. So first we have to distinguish if the bilirubin is elevated. So what is an elevated bilirubin level? An elevated bilirubin level is, for infants in greater than 35 weeks of gestation, uh, the plasma bilirubin greater than the 95th percentile on the nonogram. Okay. So based and on hours of age... Yeah, you can find the nomogram in Harriet Lane. You can find it in um, various articles on the internet. And what is an elevated direct bilirubin? Direct bilirubin is the conjugated bilirubin, and that would be an issue of extra or post-hepatic, um, like cholestasis, any sort of issues with inflammation of Angitis. Okay, so before we get into the differential, okay. what, what level of bilirubin, what, what lab value would prompt you to say this is an elevated direct? I found, I found differing things, but is it greater than 20% of the total bilirubin? That's really the number we're okay. after. Okay. Absolute numbers don't do you any good because of the law of mass action. Okay. Indirect bilirubin is your precursor, and if you have a lot of precursor, you will drive the reaction to completion and get a lot of product, thus raising your total direct bilirubin. So a child with a total bilirubin of 30 could very well be walking around with a direct of 3. Mm -hmm. Now, that child is in a world of hurt with a bilirubin of 30, but the differential diagnosis is different. And you don't need to go chasing down the cholestatic pathway. At least not at this point in time. You need to look for other issues first. So, in uh, of the two forms of hyperbilirubinemia and jaundice that we see, the direct is really the one, albeit rare, with the nastier complications, potentially. So, what what is the differential diagnosis for elevated direct or cholestatic hyperbilirubinemia? Uh, there's a lot of... Um I found uh, Krieger Najjar syndrome, okay, Krieger Najjar. Okay, uh, Gilbert syndrome. Um, some congenital hypothyroid can give it. Um, where's the rest of my list? Um, hypothyroidism, uh, any sort of liver disease, Wilson's advanced cirrhosis, which wouldn't be common in a neonate, but that's more the older, um, and that's. Okay. And Wilson's yeah. showing up in the neonate would be rare. Wilson's okay. going to be a lot more That's common in an older okay. kid. Okay. What else? That's all I have right now. Poor systemic shunts, um, any sort of drug overdoses, but again, it would be rare. Yeah, because these kids aren't getting drugs. Yeah. Um, the hemolysis. No, that's going to be more indirect. Oh, okay, yeah. I'm getting... Okay, so you get ahead of yourself. Yeah. <laughs> the big bad things are anatomic abnormalities. Okay. Okay. 
So, uh, the one you need to rule out the fastest, and the reason I want to talk about this first, oh. is biliary atresia. Okay. It's a uh, congenital problem. And, um, requires surgery? Requires surgery quickly. You okay. realistically have less than a month to perform the palliative procedure called the Kasai procedure. After that, the Kasai has always failed. Okay. And, um, you know, I mean, it's a it's a bad actor insofar as even with a successful Kasai, you're still looking at a liver transplant, but you're not looking at a neonatal liver transplant. You're looking at a transplant as an older kid, which beats the hell out of a neonatal liver transplant. Um... And if you wait more than a month, <clears throat> you're looking at a neonatal transplant. I mean, you're just, you're hosed. Okay. So you need to be quick on that one. Diagnosis. Diagnostic steps for that are pretty easy, and we'll talk about that once we've gone through the differential diagnosis. Okay. The other anatomic abnormality that can mimic this is a colidocal cyst, which is just a cyst of the colid... Colis... Common matter? Yes, thank you. Um... And uh, it can obstruct, and generally, they can just go in and cut that out. That's easy to see. You see it on ultrasound. Do they put a stent in for that, or is that they just take a stone out and then they're... It's not a stone. It's just a cyst. Oh, okay. It's a cystic okay. formation of the common bile okay. duct. Usually, they just resect the cyst. Okay. Um, although, I, I have seen patients where they've resected the cyst, and they've had ongoing issues. Okay. Um... What about, even in adults, what are some common non-alcohol related causes of um, cholecystitis and, and um, cholestasis and cholestatic jaundice? You get any infections that irritate the... Okay. Which infections? Because um, these same infections will affect neonates. I'm going to throw a dart out there and say strep because I know that hurts everything, but I don't think it's going to make it down there. No. No, um, not typically bacterial, though viral. The hepatitis? Yep, hepatitis B and C. Okay. Okay, are, are big offenders for kids. We don't see a lot of A because that's oral fecal. And these kids, you know, they're newborns. They haven't had a lot of oral. They're not getting there. So, you yeah, know, their exposure right. is a week later. Mm hmm what else, you know, even an adult, what about an ICU patient, an adult ICU patient, what's a common cause that they might get secondary cholestasis? So they didn't come in with it, they were in a car wreck, but now they've got cholestasis. What do we do to them? Parental feeding? Total parental Total nutrition, parental. yeah. Okay. And neonates are particularly sensitive to the cholestatic effects of TPN. So it happens a lot. And of... In my practice here in private practice, the number one, in private practice that has a more middle class clientele, mm -hmm. uh, the number one cause of um, cholestatic jaundice in one of my patients would be TPN cholestasis in an in ex preemie. Is, what, what is it about the TPN? I, don't, I didn't they, read anything specific. The preemies just don't handle, well, okay. patients in general don't handle the protein load well. Okay. But you need the protein load, because without it you get fatty liver. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it's... And, 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 you know, you're not eating, so you're, and you're typically uh, catabolic, so you're trying to avoid breakdown of endogenous mm -hmm. protein, so you're giving protein. Okay. But IV protein just doesn't fly real well with okay. the body. We've never figured out why. Um, and along those lines, TPN cholestasis... The TPN itself doesn't cause the cholestatic jaundice. It usually causes something to happen that causes cholestatic jaundice. What might that something be? Adults get them all the time, not related to TPN. Gallstones? Yes. Okay. Okay, or biliary sludging. Okay. Uh, we see more sludge than we see giant stones in okay. kids. But you can get frank stones, too. I've okay. seen... seen Ex preemies who, you know, we've been dealing with it for a while, but at a year of age have one centimeter stones. These things are huge. Okay. Especially in an ex preemie who weighs, you know, seven kilos. That's a big stone. Yeah. Um, realistically, those are the biggest offenders. Now, there are some other viral causes of um, 
cholestatic jaundice that are really unique to the newborn. Mostly those are the torches. CMV, uh, probably being the big offender, uh, but rubella as well, syphilis as well, as well toxoplasmosis as well. Um, so don't forget those. You may wind up needing to send a serum immune globulin. Those mm -hmm. are specific immune globulins for the specific agents. There's ways to test for individual agents. Okay. Um, but those, those are the big offenders. And then there's, there's a handful of weird metabolic genetic diseases that you've never heard of before called allergial syndrome and Filer syndrome. If the kid's funny looking... I read that in the article. I had never heard of it prior. Yeah, they're they're hard to diagnose. And you need like ophthalmologic <coughs> consultation with a good pediatric ophthalmologist. Okay. And um, perhaps a geneticist as well. And then there's one very common genetic metabolic syndrome that will cause cholestatic jaundice. It's not the G six. Nope. No, because that's the hemolysis. Yep. Um, did I get it? No. I don't think I... Much less obscure than G6PD. You very well go your entire career and never see a patient with G6PD. Mm -hmm. If you work in pediatrics, you will not go... Well, you may not finish your rotation here with me without seeing a kid with this. I don't know. What's the most common lethal single gene defect in Caucasians? I'll give you another hint. They have their very own charity. Uh, it's not muscular dystrophy. Their own charity. <laughs> Our own money to donate to charities. <laughs> you're a graduate student. Yes, you're poor. Um, Cystic fibrosis. And their okay. charity is Easter Seals. Um... Because CF causes thick mucus everywhere, and the thick mucus in the liver just causes sludging in the liver, and so the bile sits in the liver, okay. and then it backs up, and then it wreaks havoc in the liver. Okay. It's actually a very poor prognosis for cystic fibrosis. Better to have it in the lungs. We can do things to get the mucus out of the lungs. We can't put, it's real hard to put mucus thinning agents directly into the liver because mm -hmm. we don't have a direct, direct conduit to the outside mm -hmm. world. Like we do the lungs, aka the airway. So, I said earlier you need to rule out um, biliary atresia quickly, and we're going to talk about how you do that. So, how you do that when you have a kid with cholestatic jaundice, first thing you're going to do is get an ultrasound, look for a cholodocal cyst, and simultaneously set the kid up for um, a nuclear medicine HIDA uh, scan. Mm -hmm. And um, you'll prime the kid for a few days with phenobarbital because that will increase biliary clearance. And we'll rule out things like Gilbert's disease, which can mimic everything, because Gilbert's disease responds nicely to a little bit of phenobarbital. You then do the HIDA scan. You'll see no flow into the liver if this is biliary atresia. And at that point in time, the kid needs to go to the operating room. So yeah. they'll consent the kid to do couple of procedures all at once. They'll do an interoperative cholangiogram, they'll do a wedge liver biopsy because they can, and if the interoperative cholangiogram shows no flow, mm -hmm. or if they can't find bile ducts in to which to do the interoperative cholangiogram, which sometimes there's nothing to, to put a never catheter developed. into, yeah, uh, then they'll do the Kasai procedure, so they'll consent you for all three of those. And uh, the wedge biopsy, even in the case of a Kasai, is valuable because it allows us to assess for damage throughout the rest of the liver. They're only taking a tiny little piece, mm -hmm. but it helps us to know how damaged and screwed up is this liver. Um, I've definitely seen kids go to the OR and the interoperative cholangiogram came back normal. And that's CF until proven otherwise. Okay. And uh, sure enough, it was CF. And bad course for the child. So really that's about all we want to say about direct. Uh, the therapies tend to be very specific to the disease. 
but fortunately the diseases are easy to rule in and rule out. Mm -hmm. With the exception of TPN cholestasis, they're pretty pretty uncommon, really. Some of the torches, depending on where you practice and what, what your practice population is like, may be a little more common. For TPN cholestasis, do you just discontinue the TPN? But you it can't. depends. Okay. Sometimes you have no choice but to continue the TPN need, and go okay. ahead. Uh, ideally, you get the kid off the TPN, but if it's starving or continuing to damage the liver yeah. because the kid can't take by mouth, let's say they have really bad necrotizing enterocolitis, mm -hmm. then you bite the bullet. Okay. Uh, you'll deal with it on the back end. Okay. Sometimes you're dealing with it for years on the back end, but it's better than the option, which is or the alternative option, yeah. which is death. Um, you know, but in an ideal world, you get a patient, both adult, kid, elderly, neonate, off TPN as quickly as possible. Yeah. And you get any amount of enteral feeds going as quickly as possible because even small amounts of enteral feeds, even suboptimal nutrition, even suboptimal nutrition that still requires TPN because it's so suboptimal, mm -hmm. decreases your risk of TPN cholestasis. Because you're stimulating the GI tract to... Yeah, to get rid of the bile mm -hmm. and, uh, you know to dump it into the intestines. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in the case of a neonate, a milliliter of half-strength breast milk an hour is almost, is negligible calories, but is enough to prevent a lot of TPN cholestasis. Okay. Um, doesn't prevent all of it, but it prevents a lot of mm -hmm. it. So if you can get even that much, now that's, it's such suboptimal calories, those neonates are still on TPN. Uh, but the GI tracts move it a little bit. So. Yeah, and it just makes okay. all the difference in the world for, for that, as well as a whole bunch of other other things, including the ability to up the feeds later, because you can up them faster once they've had a little bit of breast milk. Okay. Uh, and the same thing is true for, you know, adults and kids. We're not feeding them breast milk, but the idea is the same. Mm -hmm. uh, small, tiny volumes, you know, five milliliters an hour in an adult, of half strength tube feeding formula of your choice, uh, or even quarter strength tube feeding formula of your choice, if they can tolerate it, will go all in an NJ tube. Will go a long way to preventing TPN cholestasis. Okay. There's negligible calories in there, so you still need the TPN, but yeah. it, it prevents a lot of that, and again decreases your time to total total oral feeding because you don't develop starvation issues in the gut. Mm. Uh, because you put just a, a tiny amount of fat in there. Okay. So you want to get, you know, this is out, really outside of what we're trying to discuss here, but in ICU management, you want to get some calories into the gut as quickly as you can, okay. uh, even if it's not going to be optimal. Um, it just makes a huge difference mm -hmm. for the patient. And then you take your time from there. Once you get a little bit of calories going, you have the luxury of a little bit of time. But you've got to get something in there. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes you can't. I mean, there's time and place for NPO for prolonged periods of time. And I could give you dozens of reasons. Gunshot mm -hmm. wounds to the belly and, you know, X laps after major trauma. And, yeah. um, you know, the list just goes on and on and on. Um, post opioidus you got post op ileus, and there's no point putting food into the intestines. It's just coming back out the mouth. Okay. Um, and they're going to aspirate it, so, yeah. so don't. But uh, if you can, do it. So now let's turn our attention to indirect, okay. which is far and away the more common form of, of hyperbilirubinemia that we deal with. And uh, with indirect, I'm going to start it off. The most common cause is physiologic jaundice. Mm -hmm. Physiologic jaundice, jaundice, by definition, is a natural process and is really a diagnosis of exclusion. So what are some other things that will cause this? Hemolysis. Okay, hemolysis. Uh, and what is the most common cause of hemolysis in a neonate? G6. No, much more common. In a neonate. G6PD is a common cause of hemolysis uh -huh. in, like, me. Especially me because of my ethnicity, but um, Gilbert syndrome is too rare. Um, let's see if I have it anywhere here. No, you're gonna kick yourself when I say it. Sepsis. Definitely Sepsis. on the differential, but not um, not the most common cause. 
I am going to kick myself. How about ABO and compatibility? Okay. Okay. Followed by RH and compatibility. Okay. And we can test for that with Coombs test. Now, I will tell you that I have seen plenty of kids who are Coombs negative who hemolyze. And I have seen plenty of kids who are Coombs positive who don't hemolyze. The perfect example was that baby from yesterday. His bilirubin was going up at six days of age. Uh -huh. When you came in the morning? Um, his bilirubin was going up at six days of age, and I really, I don't have all the tests back yet that I need, but I really suspect that uh, when we get his reticulocyte count, we're going to see it's elevated, and he's got ongoing hemolysis. Okay. Uh, just from well, the height of his bilirubin at his advanced age, but... Uh, but he was Coombs negative? But he was Coombs negative at birth. But you can't, you can't hang your hat on that. All right, we're going to come back to this in just a second. Okay, okay so coming back to part two here. So we talked about ABO incompatibility and, and the limitations of the Coombs test. Realize also that ABO is not the only blood type that can cause incompatibility. When we know about ABO, we know about RH. But the minor blood group antigens can absolutely cause it as well. Kel, Duffy, Lewis, Rho, D, um... And uh, you don't really have an ability to test for those. Okay. They're rare, but they absolutely can cause hemolysis. Okay. We just call that, um, you know, uh, Coombs positive with no ABO setup. Okay. Okay, what else? There are some other things that will cause hemolysis, so let's stay on the lines of hemolysis. You already hit on one, G6PD. G6PD has a nastier cousin. What is that? Nastier cousin... The pyruvate kinase deficiency? Yep, pyruvate kinase deficiency. Because okay. it's a little more basic and it, it uh, screws things up earlier in the process. Okay. Okay, what else? There's congenital erythropoietin porphyria. Okay, let's stay with That's hemolysis for a minute though, because there okay. are some other things that will cause hemolysis. Um, vascular abnormalities. Inherited red cell membrane defects. Okay. What are some inherited... What's the most common inherited red cell membrane defect? I didn't write it down. It's hereditary spherocytosis. Okay. Um, and hereditary lithocytosis. To a much lesser extent, the most common abnormally shaped red cells is not a membrane defect, but the most common cause of abnormally shaped red cells is uh, sickle cell. And you really don't see a lot of that causing jaundice in the neonate because you have a lot of fetal hemoglobin floating around and the fetal hemoglobin is protective against sickling, but it still can cause an issue, especially for low levels of jaundice. It shouldn't be giving you bilirubins of 20, okay. but bilirubins of 4 that are persisting, uh, you know, child of color, this could perhaps be your first indication while you're still waiting for those newborn screening labs, which include a sickle cell prep to come back. Um, so they do a smear and look at cell shape and... Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm just running down the list in my head if there's mm -hmm. anything else causes hemolysis that's common, but I think that's the most common causes of... of um, pathologic hemolysis. Okay. There are things that cause physiologic hemolysis that will make you jaundice too. They're, they're pathologic processes, but the hemolysis is physiologic. We'll come back to those. So what else do you have on the list? Um, the decrease, well, I think we already talked about the Krigler and Najar syndrome. Okay. The Gilbert syndrome. And the hypothyroidism. Okay. Um, unfortunately, I have two lists on here. Um, Hemolysis, heart failure, portosystemic shunts, okay. um, any sort of drugs, but again, they won't probably be on drugs. There is one drug that they should not be on that people sometimes mistakenly start them on that, uh, can def that definitely creates issues, which is why it's contraindicated in kids under two to four months of age. I have rifampin as my number one drug, but I don't think that's going to be mistakenly started. Yeah, rifampin, rifampin is definitely a, a bad actor, but we use it so rarely. Yeah, it's not going to be. Yeah. Um, I have probenicid, flavospatic acid. Okay. Um, probenicid's really rare. Okay. Buzz just really rare. I don't even know if 
never seen it used. I don't even know if you can still get probenicid. You'd have to work to find it. Um, I can go flip into the articles, but I don't have that. Sulfa. Okay, sulfa competes for binding sites on the albumin. And it'll decouple the bilirubin from the albumin, causing a falsely elevated or a, a elevated bilirubin, free bilirubin, okay. and uh, results in increasing jaundice and increasing risk of kernicterus. Is the free bilirubin is the one that causes the? Yep. Okay. Um, and and especially with the rise of MRSA, because you can't give doxycycline to a neonate, the reflex is to go ahead and give them if you th- okay. if you're afraid your kids get uh, MRSA. To go ahead and give them sulfa, i.e. Bactrim or okay. um, Septra, bad choice. At what age does that blood-brain barrier kind of develop to the point where, is it two to four months? So then, yeah, By two months, the blood-brain barrier for bilirubin is reasonably intact. Okay. But the problem isn't the blood-brain barrier's permeability. The problem is the competing binding sites. And the kids, mm-hmm. they don't have as much bilirubin floating around when they're older. So there's not as much, like, in you or me to okay. kick off of our albumin, so we're not okay. worried about it. And if we do kick it off, our blood-brain barrier should be intact, so we don't have to worry okay. so much about kernicterus. Okay, what else do you have on your list? Uh, systemic shunts, um, the impaired conjugation, again, like Raghel Najjar, um, hyperthyroidism, um, liver diseases, And that's... that's okay, let me tell you about a few other common ones, because these are neonates. Um, really common, if we're not dealing with hemolysis, a real common cause is elevated red cell mass. Okay, or high hematocrit. Now, there's a lot of reasons why a kid will have a high hematocrit. So I was talking about when the, the hemolysis is physiologic, these cells are designed to lice and go away pretty mm-hmm. quickly. But if you have a kid who started with a very high red cell mass, when they get rid of a lot of these excess cells, then they got a lot of bilirubin floating around. So the, okay. the destruction of the excess red cells is, is a physiologic process. Unfortunately, it results in some problems downstream. Okay. Um... So why might a kid have polycythemia, or elevated red red mass, red cell mass? Any sort of bone marrow abnormality, I feel like that would cause... Yeah, you don't see a lot of like polycythemia rubra okay. in, uh, in neonates. Um, any sort of oxygen deficiency during, during birth? Okay, well, more importantly during pregnancy, this is chronic. Okay. Uh, oxygen deficiency. Okay. So maternal hypertension, um, strokes to the placenta, partial strokes to the placenta, preeclampsia, okay. um, partial abruption, maternal use of stimulant medications, and we're usually not talking about Ritalin here. We're talking methamphetamine. Uh, methamphetamine use. Okay. Back two years ago was 99 out of 100 of these cases. Of stimulant drug use? Well, just of um, uh, of decreased placental blood flow. Okay. Now, now we're seeing more heroin abuse, so more of the decreased pl- uh, placental blood flow is actually being caused by hypertension, so at okay. least it's a natural process, albeit pathologic. Okay. Um... Mater- severe maternal anemia for okay. any reason. Um, maternal sickle cell disease will definitely do it. Okay, so that's that's the hypoxic end. What's another reason why a, a neonatal have a lot of red cells? If they're asplenic? No. This one might strike you as a little weird. Uh, infants of diabetic mothers. Because in, in infants of diabetic mothers, they have a lot of sugar floating around, both in the mm-hmm. mom and the sugar crosses into the neonate. What do red cells eat? They eat sugar. Mm-hmm. If there's a lot of sugar around, there's a lot of red cells around. They don't die off like they're supposed to. Okay. And then you clamp the cord, the sugar's cut off, and all of a sudden those cells lice, and the kid's blood is sludging, so they need the lice. Okay. But then they become jaundiced from it. Um... And some of the most difficult cases of prolonged, albeit somewhat 
you know, a prolonged moderate jaundice where we're on lights for phototherapy for days on end and mm -hmm. the kids aren't responding or in infants of diabetic mothers. Okay. You know, we're not necessarily doing exchange transfusions, but they can be very frustrating cases. Okay. Um, and then another very common one is extravascular extravasation of blood. Why would a neonate have extravascular extravasation of blood? We see a lot of cephalohematomas in newborns, especially vaginally delivered newborns, especially if they had difficult delivery, okay. with a lot of pushing, especially if they were vacuum assisted. Okay. Um, it's just a, a real common scenario. And those cephalohematomas can be the size of baseball. On a okay. neonate's head, that gives you an idea how big they are, and then it just gets lice and yeah, like and... like red like red blood that's been extravasated under your fingernail yeah. or in a, under your skin in a bruise. It's yeah. got to be Clean be up. liced and broken down, and unfortunately, okay. that can raise your bilirubin. Okay. Um. Uh, phenylketonuria, hereditary um, tyrosinemia can do this to you as well. Sepsis can cause an elevated bilirubin, both direct and indirect. Mm -hmm. uh, a UTI is a common cause of elevated indirect bilirubin without bacterial sepsis. So in a kid over two weeks of age who has persistent jaundice, check a calf urine. Wouldn't it, I, I would think it would cause elevated conjugated bilirubin with a UTI because they're not clearing as much, but... No, because their the renal function is still good. Okay. So they're clearing the same amount. It's just the cytokines themselves from the low-grade sepsis. Okay. Um, breast milk jaundice. This one is a weird one. And I I couldn't differentiate between the the breastfed and then the breast milk. There's two different ones. Yeah, don't don't hang up on okay. breastfeeding versus breast milk. Breastfeeding okay. jaundice really is just because the kid got dehydrated mom's milk hasn't come in yet and it's taking a little longer than we'd okay. like baby's dehydrated so he's hemoconcentrated and okay. that raises the level of the bilirubin okay. you put a little bit of fluid in that kid of whatever form you like and, and things are much better okay. breast milk jaundice is a little more complicated some women secrete in their breast milk uh, a hormone known as inhibin we have no idea what inhibin is supposed to do for you at least I have no idea what it's supposed to do for you. And if anybody knows, I'd like to find out what it's supposed to do. Yeah. But we know that one of the things it does is that it inhibits the conjugation of bilirubin. Okay. We diagnose it, and it's most common in the second week of life, so 7 to 14 days of age. Uh, we diagnose it by taking the kid off breast milk for a day or two, putting them on formula during that time, and then drawing their bilirubin levels, and they should have plummeted. Okay. Um, and then you just put them back on breast milk, tell mom, you know, it's going to be weeks before his jaundice goes away, but don't okay. worry about it. Because then he just develops the ability to process the... Uh, not, not understood. Okay. We, we don't know. It, okay. it may be that he downregulates his inhibitor receptors. It may okay. be that the neonate uh, just gets bigger and it becomes less of an issue. Okay. It may be that... Um, baby starts digesting the inhibit in his gut, okay. and it's protein put in the gut, it could be digested, we call that meat. Uh, we don't really know, okay. but it, it does go away over time. More importantly, nobody gets kernicterus from, from breastfeeding okay. jaundice, so as long as okay. we've maybe been able to rule that in, we can pretty much relax. Okay. Um, and of course, of all of this, the major side effect or the major complication, the thing you're trying to pre prevent is kernicterus. Kernicterus absolutely positively does happen. And uh, I can't show the video here on this video because of HIPAA, uh, but I do have permission to show my students in my, from the individuals involved. I have permission to show this video to students in my office, so mm -hmm. you'll, get, you'll see a video okay. of uh, kernicterus later. It's devastating. And I'm sure on YouTube from... Other countries, there's lots yeah. of videos of connectors, places where HIPAA does not apply. So, uh, I think that's a pretty good discussion of the differential diagnosis of hyperbilirubinemia and, and the things we're worried about. And I, again, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about when to start lights. Look it up. Mm -hmm. Follow the nomogram. Yeah. That's what we do. I mean, I've done this enough that I have the nomogram committed to memory at certain major points, but 
that's just what we're doing. Yeah. So look it up and follow that. Yeah. You can look it up in a book too. Um, you got to act quickly, mm -hmm. and you got to be you know be right. That that baby we were dealing with yesterday that was seen by people who shall remain nameless. His Billy Rubin was going up, and they took him off the lights and sent him home, and now it's through the roof. Uh, and if it doesn't come down quickly, he's going to the hospital. And did they do that baby any favors? No. And I'm not sure, I, for the life of me, can't figure out why they did what they did. Um, Maybe they discharged him before they got the lab work? <laughs> I mean, that wouldn't make sense. In, I know. <laughs> you know, primary care, the nature of it is even if you sent the kid home, you have a phone number. Yeah. I have a face sheet. Yeah. You call them. Yeah. Um, so, I, I don't know. But you you, you got to be right, because you really run the risk of screwing this kid up. If this particular child who came to see us yesterday, let's say they decided they weren't going to come in until two weeks of age. Or let's say they decided they weren't going to come in until they were two months old when they needed shots. And we see that all the time. Just because mm -hmm. you said follow up in 48 hours doesn't mean they're going to actually do that. How high would have his Billy Rubin gone? 25, 30, 35? I don't know. And I don't want to find out. How long does it take for Kernicterus to start developing or become an issue? Is it one to two days? I mean, how, I mean that's, that's the rub. I, uh, yeah. And the real frustrating part of this. To give a parallel for those of you who know how to scuba dive, uh, and those of you who know me well know I'm a scuba instructor, with uh, several agencies that shall remain nameless. Um, because I don't want to promote one scuba training agency over another here on an educational video. Uh, the nature of the bends in mm -hmm. scuba diving is that there is no table, no computer, no model that completely predicts and thus prevents the bends. So you okay. can get bent by staying well within the limits of the table. We don't understand it. There are people at Duke University in particular, Duke University and uh, University of Washington, a guy named um, Why am I drawing a blank on the guy at University of Washington? Um, I can think of his first name, but I can't think of his last name. And there's a whole host of people mm -hmm. at uh, Duke University working with a group called Divers Alert Network. That that's all they do for a living. Study. study the bends and try to figure out how we can tweak the tables to get a model that's closer to 100% prevention. Okay. It's the same deal here. There's okay. just so many physiologic variables and, and chaos theory kind of comes into play okay. that we really don't understand it. Uh, we know, you know, if I give a one-day-old Billy Ribbon of 30, there's a really good chance he's going to get connectorous. Okay. And if I give a one day old a Billy Rubin of 40, he's probably going to have Kernicterus. Okay. Uh, and if I give a two day old a Billy Rubin of 50, he'll probably have Kernicterus. Okay. But where is that threshold? We don't really okay. know. And we set our thresholds much lower than that to try okay. to prevent all of it, and it prevents most of it, but nothing prevents 100% of it. And in fact, the kid I'm going to show you the video of was an ex 35 week preemie, so not particularly preemie. Okay. And he's got horrible kernicterus. Uh, and if, and, and I didn't meet him until he was like 10 years old, so all the all the, the data and the lab work and all of that was long since buried. Good luck okay. ever sifting through it. But what I was able to find, his maximum bilirubin was 15. It was not that high. But he was an ex-premie, and I think he was probably septic. And when you combine those two, your threshold's much lower, and it just got away from people. Did he receive treatment for it? Hmm? Okay. You know, but if, if you have a kid who's really high risk, you jump to doing a double volume exchange transfusion. So if I've got a kid who's really preemie, really septic, really jaundiced, yeah. I don't wait to see if they're going to respond to lights. I give them blood. Things. We just do double volume exchange transfusion. We start the lights while we're getting the blood brought to the floor and yeah. setting everything up. But we don't screw around and wait. His Billy Rubin was never really in the hmm. transfusion range. But whatever the variables were that were in place, when you see the video, he clearly has uh, choreoathostatic type cerebral palsy. And by definition, that's kernicterus. And it's severe. 
Um, so it's very frustrating and a little scary. Yeah. But the models, the best models, just like the Bend, the best models, dive at your own risk. Is what we teach everybody. Yeah. There's always a chance you're going to get bent. Knock on yeah. wood, I have almost 400 dives and have never been injured in any way, shape, or form other yeah. than um, a couple of scratches from uh, rough edges on the boat. And It's pretty good. It's pretty good odds. It's a little bit of seasickness. Yeah. Um, brushed my hand against the fire one once. But it was just a minor brush, and it was just a few little prickles. Yeah. I've been stung by a few minor jellies that didn't even leave marks. Yeah. I can also introduce you to people who've done five dives and been bent. bent. Mm-hmm. Um, staying within the limits of the tables prevents that most of the time, yeah. but nothing is 100%. Okay. Um, drive, dive your billy ribbon at your own risk, too. Unfortunately, yeah. the kid has no control over that, and to a point, the doctors don't either, and that's something yeah. the lawyers don't understand. We are very conservative because unlike the Benz, which is usually not fatal and can be treated on being very painful and very expensive, Kernicterus, once it happens, is permanent. Yeah. But um, nothing prevents 100% of it, and you can get burnt in spite of doing everything perfectly, and that's just very scary. Yeah. Anyway, I hope this has been educational. I hope this helps. This is Dr. Kevin Windish from Sparks Pediatric and Adolescent Medicine. If you'd like to schedule a rotation with us or if we can be of assistance to provide consultation, please give us a call at area code 775-359-7111. We'll see you next time.